All right, everyone, I'd like to introduce our first panel called the State of CRE Tech, the Executive's POV. Um, we have some really fantastic panelists that are gonna shed light on some of the technologies that they're using, uh, what's working, what's the ROI, what's still a challenge in technology adoption uh, today in the industry, both within their uh, portfolios as well as their internal operations. Um, and I'm just gonna start with everyone giving a brief introduction of themselves and their role um, and who you are with. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jackson Slavik. I work with Veritas Investments um, in our innovations department. Uh, I bucket that in four categories really quickly. Early stage, venture capital, seed and series A investments typically. Consumer partnerships, rent from us, get your 20 bucks a month off Uber here, Giants tickets. Third, uh, tech ops, so implementing SaaS solutions, typically point solutions in our workflows internally. And then fourth being other. Anything one of these crazy guys throws at me and anything Silicon Valley startup, he hits my desk first and then we um, work on it internally. I'm Jake Fingert, I'm a partner at Camber Creek. We're a real estate technology focused uh, venture capital firm based in New York and Washington DC. Um, we've been investing in the space since 2011. We've made over 20 investments, um, all in uh, real estate technology. So Charlie Koontz with Heinz. Um, uh, recently took on a role as uh, innovation officer within the firm to be uh, tracking new services and technologies that we should be thinking about broader partnerships and potential investments uh, across our platform. And I'm Meredith Treister with TH Real Estate, and we are one of the largest global asset managers of real estate. Um, Domestically, we have s about 15 billion AUM, and I manage about 25% of that. So Charlie, I'm gonna start with you and talk about a little bit in a general sense, how has technology changed your business? Um, <clears throat> so there's obviously a lot of new tools and a lot of different things that are going on um, in our space for us to use today, but by far I think what's driving the biggest change that's occurring for us is that the change that's occurring for our customers and for our occupants of our buildings, particularly on the office side, um, is moving still much more rapidly than it is in real estate. So you see, uh, particularly as it relates to needs for flexibility and additional tools in your buildings and so forth, um, the uh, growth of, or the speed of change that's happening just across the economy is something that uh, is really technology driven in a lot of ways. And so the, the changes that we're seeing, the things that we're trying to keep up with, I think are really driven by the fact that um, our users of our products, their, uh, their world's changing uh, much more quickly than it ever has before. Yeah, absolutely. Meredith, do you want to shed some light on how technology is changing the nature of your business? Sure, I mean, to echo what Charlie said, but also just internally, we're a huge organization and you know, problem that we have is that we have all these systems and you know, 20% of my time is process and not doing the actual work, and so that's a challenge for me personally. And then as the user, you know, how do we, how do we build buildings, or sorry, how do, we, how do we own buildings and manage buildings in a way that keeps tenant retention, and uh, you know, we don't wanna be the last one of the party depending on what the technology is, so. Yeah, absolutely. Jackson, so you guys have fundamentally created a whole new position around technology, identifying, evaluating, but do you wanna speak a little bit to that and generally how it's changing? Yeah, sure. So by virtue of being here in San Francisco, first off, Veritas, we're the largest multifamily and ground floor retail owner here in the city, kind of a big fish in a small pond. And what that means is being in the hub of tech internationally, we see great stuff all the time, maybe more than you might see in other geos. And uh, that necessitated kind of bringing someone internally, bringing a way of thinking internally that's um, a little more symbiotic with the tech world, someone that kind of speaks startup, as I would say. Um, and so that has been my role. We, any, like I said, anything that feels Silicon Valley, anything that feels startup-y, anything that feels techy, I think hits someone's desk that can evaluate it best first, and that would be someone from that world, right? If you're an asset management person, there's an asset management tool, well then you should see that underwriting model first, right? If you're an innovations guy and there's a new SaaS platform, who's gonna evaluate that? I think it takes a really specialized skill, and um, if you have the right person internally to take from a core business function and move them more towards tech, kind of like Charlie Hines, great. If you're starting fresh, I always say, get someone from the tech world and teach them your asset class. I think it's more of a way of thinking and a inherent skill set that's important versus um, really understanding the business itself. It's, they're two very, very different things, in my opinion. 
And you're kind of bridging that gap internally within your organization. Yeah, exactly. I think especially at the executive level when, uh, you know, your inbox is a disaster, your calendar is a disaster, you want to learn a new piece of tech. What's, what the hell's blockchain? What is this SaaS? What is this or that? You need someone internally that can kind of help support you, educate the team, educate the group, be cross-departmental, cross-functional, and understand how to implement wherever it is best implemented across the business. And that's someone, you know, to my heart, in my opinion, that comes from the tech world, that comes from Silicon Valley, that, that knows those things inherently, uh, first and foremost. Yeah, so your perspective is totally different from a traditional real estate context, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Jake, you got, you're in a totally separate role here, um, and we've really, we've seen an absolute explosion of technology into the space in the last, you know, five plus years here, uh, quite a short amount of time, to be quite frank. How are you evaluating the technologies that you're ultimately investing in? Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, so in a prior life, I was an executive at GSA, which does all the real estate for the federal government. And in, in that role, I had the opportunity to work across a variety of different businesses at GSA. So from acquisitions, to dispositions, to tenant management. Um, and one, one of the things um, that we have seen over the last five years is just the incredible velocity that you mentioned at which uh, new technologies are coming onto the market. And if you think about how broad real estate is, right, there are so many different business units and workflows and all of those are ripe for technological innovation. So the way we, we think about it at, at Camber Creek is we'll often think about the specific problems that need to be solved within the business. So whether it's a workflow issue, uh, whether it's a you know, tenant satisfaction issue, what, what are the different issues or problems that real estate owners and operators face? Uh, and then we'll develop a market map around those uh, different problem sets and we'll track companies. And oftentimes we get to know companies for two or three years before we actually make an investment. And we'll really get to deeply understand the relative value proposition of those different companies so that when we do invest, we can have strong conviction that we're picking the companies that are poised to win in their segment. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Charlie, how are you, uh, how are you guys evaluating the tech that you're implementing ultimately? So. Um, our approach is obviously a little bit different as a real estate company. I, I frankly don't think that our capital is particularly exciting to a lot of uh, tech companies. I think that what we have to offer and the, the conversations that we have that are productive are ones that are much more kind of operationally focused mm -hmm. uh, to be a, a customer of the product. Right. And then to uh, then in some circumstances be able to participate in the growth that occurs is helpful. So for us, it's, um, much more about, and, and this is probably, and this is interesting because it goes back to your comment, which was a, a bit different than the way that we're approaching this, Jackson, which is that um, we, we put someone in this role at Heinz that uh, has real estate experience, actually. Like it's so that as we see technologies, the question that I ask myself is, is this something I would want in my project? Is this something that makes sense to me that I would want to use? And I think the reason why we feel like we need to do that is that, um, our innovation team's job then is to go out and be able to speak that same language to all the individuals out managing their own individual projects so that they can decide whether they want to be utilizing this technology or not. And so it becomes, the communication component becomes pretty fundamental. And so um, uh, we, everything that we're looking at, we're looking at primarily on an operating basis. And then to the extent that there's something exciting there from a growth perspective, then we think about uh, potentially uh, uh, usually an, an indirect, but occasionally we've looked, explored some direct investments as well. Sure, sure, that makes a lot of sense. Meredith, how, what's the evaluation process like for you guys when adopting new technology, whether it's you know an investment or just generally adopting within portfolio or operations? Yeah, so we, we look at return on investment, obviously. Um, we like to have the process or the, the system happen inside of our own chassis because we want to be able to analyze the data that we're collecting in our own portfolio. So, um, so how scalable is it across our portfolio through different asset classes, um, uses, that sort of thing? And then, uh, how iterative and communicative are the you know are the companies with us to kind of work on it? I mean, just because we use a product one way doesn't mean that's the way the rest of the world's going to use it. And so, we certainly want to be able to customize it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Jackson, how about you guys? You're, you're probably directly evaluating most of the tech that comes through the door, it sounds like. Yeah, I wear uh, a venture hat and an ops hat, kind of depending on the situation, sometimes both. And the, evaluating, the evaluation process lends itself to both ways of thinking, right? So we, by wearing an ops hat, would I want to use this? Okay, well, then I should invest in it. Or does this look like a really interesting investment opportunity? Should I do it? Well, would I use it? So 
it's super helpful to, to kind of be internally and do both. And I think partnerships with VCs like Camber Creek, we did a, a deal with them last year in Latch that's been super successful. They led the round, we invested in it, we use it all across our buildings. It's those sort of kind of joint ventures and those partnerships that um, are super helpful as we evaluate, right? You wanna lean on the expert in whatever you have. No company or no person's gonna have 100% of the skill set or the knowledge themselves to do it. Um, Especially because a lot of it is brand new, right? It's all brand new. It's all like, who knows what blockchain is, right? Like, we're all learning this as we go together. Anybody that tells you they really know what it is is either the smartest guy in the room or probably not being totally honest with himself or you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's all brand new, and you need that, you need that environment, that culture, that team effort to really uh, evaluate things as a group. And then you need conviction. Right? What I'm seeing with a lot of owners is we like to manage down to the basis point, right, on everything, and that's just not possible in this world, and it's a totally different way of thinking, of thinking like, well, what's the risk on this, you know, garden style investment in Houston versus like this SaaS implementation internally or this SaaS venture uh, investment. So it's just a sophisticated investors on both sides, but just completely sure. different skill set. Sure. And uh, it's tough to be honest, but it's, it's exciting and it's fun. So on, a, on a side oh. note on blockchain, I, I have the honor of having my first blockchain tenant in the entire portfolio. Ooh. Uh, yeah, so uh, so I read a book about blockchain, <laughs> and uh, I asked our data scientists about it, and I personally adopt the keep it stu uh, simple, stupid model, and I still don't get it, but but they <laughs> have agreed to pay their rent in, in fiat money and not <laughs> cryptocurrency, so. <laughs> um, anybody want to give a quick, you know, what is blockchain? No, no, no. <laughs> No. I'll, I'll jump on it. I think yeah. uh, everyone gets scared by the fluctuations in crypto. If Bitcoin goes up 10,000%, somebody sneezes and it goes down 500%. Like nobody really knows what's going on that, because its value is inherently in and of itself. People like Bitcoin, so it's valuable. That's it. Blockchain is the technology that underpins that, but really the take home here is we work with smarter guys than me that understand this much better. For those in the room that are thinking about how to think about it, it's the difference between snail mail and email. You don't care how it works. You just know that it does work. And uh, if I was a middleman, I'd be sweating. Because anybody that's kind of in between, that's taken a point, point and a half, two points here or there, fees on this deal, fees on that contract, uh, you would do well to learn about it. Am I it. in trouble? It's an ICO, an initial coin offering company. Yeah, there's, <laughs> uh -oh. we, right. let's talk about it afterwards. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, the take home here is snail mail to email. It works much, much, much better. Nobody knows here how email works, but we all know what it does. That's the T. You're gonna, in 10 years, you're gonna be doing a transaction every day that's gonna leverage the blockchain, and you won't even know that it's on the blockchain. It's not gonna be a buzzword anymore. It's just gonna be how we all conduct business, I think. Ultimately, it's a, it's a digital encrypted ledger. It's a way of keeping track of uh, transfer of value from one place to another. It can be applied in so many variety of ways, both in real estate as well as a million other industries. We absolutely haven't seen it uh, you know, work its full potential. It's maybe playing a role in real estate, which is why it's being brought up right now, but not quite yet. So we're early days, uh, like all of us can agree, we're all learning kind of together uh, where it will go and where it'll reach its full potential. Um, but everything from, you know, uh, transference of titles to, pro you know, municip municipal tax information to a million other variety of ways that um, we'll see it play out. But this is certainly not the goal of this panel. So what I want to jump into next is, um, and Jackson, we'll start with you. Um, what are some of, the, you know, what are some of your priorities as it relates to adopting tech into your portfolio? Is there a specific niche that you're focused on, maybe not, maybe your job is just to look at all of it. I'm sure all of you have different perspectives, but talk about your priorities as it relates to tech adoption. Oh, well, ironically, I'm gonna go straight to blockchain. That's the first. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, anybody that's in capital markets that's interested in blockchain, come talk to me afterwards. We've got some great stuff to talk about. Um, other than that, a central thesis that drives the way I think and the way we do business is, I'm of the opinion that we are wrong about multifamily. There's too many finance guys involved. Multifamily in and of itself is inherently a consumer product category. And anything that emphasizes that customer life cycle, anything that emphasizes that idea, um, we really try to double down on. And that can mean a lot of things. That means anything from the way you build your building. So what do consumers really want? Do people really care about the movie theater? Do they want something else? That's a consumer decision. Um, do people need things in their apartment? Do they want dog walkers to come in? Do they want cleaners? Well, that takes a latch. It's like, we think about the tenant landlord relationship. I think it's the most under monetized relationship in the world, even though most people have their highest uh, percentage of disposable income goes to their rent. It's like the landlord is kind of like taking it guilty 
at, at arm's length. We know this is a lot of money, but we're just taking it anyways. I think that we try to double down. We try to double down on that relationship and get involved and offer way more dog walking, cleaning. And anybody that, you know, I, I talk to a lot of owners that say, well, we'll just hire a dog cleaner. We'll just do it. That's a, no, that's a tech decision. You have access control. You have liability. You need to have a rev share. You need sure. to have billing. You need to have mo like it's, it's a tech decision for sure. Um, and so that's kind of on the consumer side, but also there's this other side of it that most people call like tenant relations, resident services, resident relations, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. In the same way that we all deal with Amazon and Uber and Google every day, and we expect a certain level of service as a consumer, our tenants should ex be expecting that from us. And so even if it's not a piece of technology that touches the tenant directly, even if they're not aware of it directly, mm -hmm. we try to think about their experience as a consumer as we implement things internally that make their lives better. So for example, I'm wearing the Apple shirt today, seeing us here in the front row CEO. Uh, that is an internal tool, communication tool focused on having better communication with our tenants and learning from that communication, essentially. Cena can give a better, better description than that. But our tenants don't know we use that, but we use it because it's a consumer-facing tool. It's a consumer-focused tool, I should say. And uh, so for me personally, that's probably the area, the way that I think of the most as being most important. In, User experience. Develop. Yeah, super important. Exactly. Across, across asset classes, I, I, I tend to think. Yeah, Especially exactly. as it's becoming more consumerized, not just in the multifamily space, um, but in, in many of the others as well. So um, I guess I'll jump to Charlie. What are some of your priorities as it relates to tech adoption in your portfolio? So ours is not too dissimilar, actually, from, from Jackson's. I think that uh, we're trying to do anything we can to uh, improve the service level and the uh, uh, the relationship that we have, uh, and this is on the commercial side though, because we agree with a lot of what you just said, Jackson, on the um, residential side and on the on the commercial side, I think that they're, uh, uh, we're hoping to help um, with the mental adjustment that's happening between landlords and tenants to think of them as a customer, um, as opposed to someone that you, you know, you bludgeon, you know, one another for the best tenure deal you can possibly get. And it's it's something that I think you know, clearly other companies are stepping into that space and providing those kinds of services. And regardless of how you feel about the way that they're setting up those models, it's very clear that our customers like that use case. Um, and so we are doing, uh, um, we've got several initiatives in place now to help us deliver on that. And so we're utilizing technology the best, case, the best way we can to just really try to improve flexibility and service um, uh, in our multifamily projects, certainly, but in our office buildings, because I think office is even substantially further behind in that mentality oh, than, than residential is. Absolutely. And we have more information about how tenants are using the space now more than ever, right? We heard from Density earlier today, and you can really kind of tailor some of these amenities some of the activations and programming to the needs and, and, and real information about how people are using space. Meredith, how about you? Yeah, so one of our mottos is we're investing in tomorrow's world. And so obviously innovation is, is one of those things. Um, and sustainability too. I mean, it's the right thing to do to leave the world better than, than we have inherited it. And so, um, so we're looking at things that can improve that as well. Yeah, and I have my next question is actually, how is technology playing in, in a role into your sustainability strategy, yeah. which I'd, we, I think yeah. we'd be interested in hearing so, more about. Uh, so we're, in 2019, we're rolling out a segment in every investment committee memo that goes to committee that we have a sustainability section to talk about what is the 100 year flood zone of where we are and is there any way to mitigate that? Um, of course, uh, you know, to be a little cynical, we looked at a map of New York and we thought, oh my God, we need to be buying in lower Manhattan a lot more um, because in 20 years, it's gonna be, there's gonna be a little more, more water happening. Um, on the flip side, you know, if you're gonna own an asset for 30 to 50 years, you know, do you wanna buy in that area, right? So that those are things we're looking at. Yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and, I, and I don't wanna dovetail away too much because um, Jake, I wanna hear about what your priorities are as it relates to uh, your tech investments, what kinds of pro you know, products and services are catching your eye, what's exciting, what are you guys looking at? Yeah, sure, so we, we think about uh, fundamentally three things when we make an investment. Um, first is we have a very broad network of folks who have invested in our fund that are owners and operators of real estate and real estate related companies. Uh, and the first question we ask is, can these companies create meaningful value for the folks in our network? Uh, and if they can, we can then de-risk our investment by having a really deep understanding of the value proposition and also having the ability to help those companies scale up rapidly. Uh, the second thing we'll do is we'll ask, is this gonna be a category winner? So uh, we do a very extensive deep dive into any space that we're gonna invest in. We make sure we understand 
Uh, the top players in that space will often pilot two or three or four different companies uh, as a part of that process. Um, as a great example of that, we were, when we, we were one of the early investors in a company called VTS, which I'm sure many of you know. Uh, when we were doing our diligence on VTS, we probably spent about a year and a half getting to know the category, trying out a few of the different competitors, uh, getting a really deep understanding of the landscape, and then uh, we well, got to the point where we had strong conviction that VTS, when merged with Hightower, was going to be the winner in that space, and, and that was at the point at which we made our investment. Um, the, the, the third thing that we look at um, is can we get a venture like return? We are a venture capital firm. We do care uh, a lot about returns. Um, so we do a lot of work underwriting the deals, looking at you know, the cash flows of a business, looking at the projections, making sure that it's highly scalable and uh, companies are going to uh, you know, eventually be, be, uh, be very successful. We don't want to invest in a company that may, maybe has a great product or solution, but it's you know, running through cash really quickly oh, and sure. it's going to go out of business in 12 months. That doesn't do anyone any good yeah how much feedback are you guys getting from uh the real estate professionals and, and the industry itself like either before and what kind of uh you know yeah. point yeah it's a great it, question um so as i mentioned uh, a lot of our investors are owners and operators of, of real estate and real estate related companies and the one rule that we have before we take money from anyone is that we have a principal level relationship with mm -hmm. that firm. Um, so for us, that means the ability to call someone up and very quickly get feedback on a space, very, very quickly get feedback on a product or service, uh, you know, talk to the right person in the organization about potentially doing a pilot if we're looking at something that we think could be interesting for them. Sure. Um, you know, generally speaking, our investors, you know, the agreement we have is not, you know, if we call them up and say, well, you do a pilot, they don't, they don't have to agree to do that. That's not the relationship we want. Uh, the relationship we want is one where if we see a company that's really exciting, we say, hey, would you look at this to potentially do a pilot? They'll give it a hard look and they'll sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. figure out whether or not it could be valuable for them. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. That makes a lot of sense. And so um, I want to talk now about just kind of what are some of the things that you're looking for in tech, either partnerships or investment companies. Um, I know, I mean, we've been doing this now for five years with Disrupt CRE. And when we first started, the landscape of this space didn't look nothing like it does now. You had, you know, siloed solution after siloed solution. Nobody integrated. But it spoke like folks like you guys sitting up here on the panel talking to, you know, certainly the industry, but also the tech players in the room saying this is what we need from you guys integrate for example at the basics um but what you else took my answer <laughs> well you know i think many of them have open apis they're willing to integrate they're willing to take feedback especially if they're early stage and they want to hear from you guys as the clients um but what kinds of other stuff as you're just working with them and, and investing and adopting what are the things that you're looking for for in qualities in these tech companies i'll take that one so for the entrepreneurs in the room that are building platforms or products or whatever, uh, I can't stress enough how important it is to understand the operating platforms of the real estate companies, whether it's RealPage or Yardi or Affiliate or whatever it is. It's not necessarily table stakes, but it's pretty close to be able to play well with whatever the central operating system of that company is. For us, um, the closed nature of these systems is not ideal for anyone besides the systems, right? So it's kind of a give and take of whether you want to break it up or not. Something I always look for is, is there a point solution I can chip away from this operating system on and use it, but it still plays nice with the central system because my accounts are going to come kill me if I mess up any of the accounts, right? So uh, that's, to me, that's kind of the first thing we talk about is like, do you know what Yardi is? Do you know what RealPage is? Are you going through the API interface program? Uh, to anybody in the back or anybody that's presenting, I would say that's the number one thing. If you don't, if you don't at least know that, it shows that you're not a serious player in the space and probably not worth the time for a pilot because um, it's going to take a year just to get through that program. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say to to companies out there, um, one certainly know the space you're playing in really well, but two. Uh, have a really clear and compelling uh, value proposition that you can articulate. Uh, I talk to a lot of companies that will spend you know, 20, 30 minutes if you let them telling you about what they do uh, and not what problem do they solve or what value are they creating. And I think really understanding you know, from an owner or operator standpoint, what, what pain am I relieving for you or what value am I creating for you? Uh, is really important. So being able to tie that to your broader story about what you're doing, but really having that that sort of elevator pitch nailed. So I would say that um, uh, for all of the uh, companies out there that are you know creating partnerships with real estate companies, whatever your expectations are as it relates to implementation, <laughs> like triple it. 
And if you feel like you're losing your mind, you are not alone because they're, uh, the, the ability to really go through implementation with this kind of stuff um, uh, takes a very long time because you have to answer the same question a million times as you all are all experiencing. And so for us, um, beyond all the basics that um, I think we can all agree upon that are important for, uh, uh, for partnerships, it's, it's really the, 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 it's kind of the soft stuff for us. It's the attitude that the leadership of the company has to really want to create a partnership to, frankly, like suffer together for a while. Yeah. And um, make sure that it gets figured out because it's not really something upon which we're just buying something and it's over. It's like we, we have to figure out over a period of years how this technology is going to work and as the world then continues to evolve around us, how do we solve those problems together as well? So that's a um, key factor. Just, just to add to that quickly because I think that's a great point, Charlie. I, I would say also just know your sales cycle really well. Um, for those of you who come from the real estate industry, you know that selling into real estate can be really, really challenging. Uh, it can take people a really long time to make decisions. Uh, so having a really deep understanding of what your sales cycle is as a company, who are the decision makers you need to be in front of, how long it takes them to make a decision, what are the things they're thinking about when they make a decision, I think that's really important uh, if you're going to be successful. And then ultimately, you know, the client success uh, thereafter, the implementation, making sure everyone can, you guys as the users are comfortable, excited, and that it's a seamless kind of integration, right? Um, not just saying, here you go, here's my great technology, see you guys later, hope it works out. Um, and, I, and we've heard a lot of those kind of stories, and unfortunately it puts kind of a, a, a damper on future technology adoption and kind of the space as a whole, which is, which is really unfortunate. Um, Meredith, how about you? Um, what are some of the qualities you guys are I'm looking for? I'm passing on this one. I feel oh, like okay. we nailed it. Yeah, yeah we, have, we have some really great answers. No, that's fantastic. Keep Keyback, it as, I hope. Keep Same. it as cheap as possible and make it as easy to use as possible. <laughs> that's, there you go. There you go. That's it. And I hope all you guys out there from tech startups, tech companies are, are listening to this. I mean, these are, these are your users. Um, I want to go back to talk a little bit more about kind of this nature of consumerization and uh, really the nature of how real estate is moving towards a B2C and sometimes even C2C model um, and what that means for you guys as you're making real estate de decisions, how technology is playing a role. If anyone wants to jump in there, go for it. I'll, I'll try not to repeat myself on that. <laughs> um, I, uh, w one thing I'll say is, um, being that we totally agree that that's the case, uh, what we're trying to do is, as a firm is just take better advantage of the fact that um, we are a larger scale portfolio, whereas in the past that hasn't really been much of a decision making influence for a lot of companies. It's really about the individual market, the individual building, the individual need right then and there. And one of the things that we're trying to explore is how we can be a little bit more of a, um, a holistic solutions provider to large entities, um, because that's something that we actually are positioned to do and probably could take better advantage of. So um, uh, that is um, whatever we can do from a, a technology perspective to help make that happen, we're, we're trying. But really, more than anything else, it's just um, uh, a, a difference in kind of the mode upon which you think about the relationship with, with, um, with your tenant. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll try not to read myself again as well. But uh, I think a lot of people think about consumer, the amenitization war is kind of like, only the dog walking, only the cleaning, only the smart thermometer, and that's great, and we should all be doing and thinking about those things more and more, but I think what gets lost in the shuffle is really how your internal operations affect your consumer relationship. What is your communication? How are you communicating with your residents? The thing that pisses off our residents the most are the things that we can fix the e most easiest. It's communication, it's getting the notices up on time, it's sending the right text, it's really listening when they email us something and understanding what they mean. To me, that's also kind of the con amenity consumer side of the business. Uh, it's a lot more than kind of the bells and whistles of the, the yoga teacher in the courtyard, which is great. But I think to owner operators that are in the room, really focusing on your communication on the soft side of the consumer relationship. What do you want as a consumer? When you get in an Uber, how do you want your support call to look? When you have to return something to Amazon, what's that like, right? Like that sort of line of thinking I think is gonna come more and more and more into the real estate world. I'm talking from a multifamily perspective, but definitely from office, definitely from retail. Anytime anyone's giving you money for something, they're your customer. And uh, I think this is now vertical in these asset classes where that's becoming more and more and more the case. And I think a lot of the, in a lot of cases, your residents, your tenants are driving a lot of the decisions that you guys are making on a, on a, company, uh, on a company level, which is that new to an extent? I mean, 
Do we see that on steroids a little bit today? It's a good question. I think what we're seeing, and uh, I'm sure everybody is, as it relates to, you know, um, like companies that can execute on co-living really well. They've mm -hmm. found ways to actually stay out of the way, you know, as opposed to trying to like create the thing. Instead, you just allow this platform and a new communication mechanism to, you know, encourage the, you know, the the users of the space to to actually be creating the events and doing all this stuff their own, on their own. And so um, I, I, I don't know if it's fundamentally new so much as it's more and more service providers and operators are realizing that um, the best, the most genuine way upon which you can create those community environments is to kind of create a blank canvas and have all the support necessary to allow it to happen, and, but to stay out of the way and not try to be the center of the attention of the community creation. Interesting. One more thing I'd add to that point is, I think we see more, right now it's all finance people, guys and gals at the top, and I think more and more we will see kind of the tech mindset, the consumer mindset, com product mindset, running these large multinational or national corporations, whatever they are. I think any boardroom you're in now, it's going to be a lot of basis point conversations, it's going to be a lot of finance, which is appropriate, you should know that, but more and more I think an appreciation of the consumer experience, an appreciation of what tenants really want, having a uh, look and feel for that is going to, what's matter to, your, is going to be what matters to your business. And uh, an example of that would be WeWork. I think people think of WeWork as like an office disruptor, which it certainly is, but I think they were born of a really clear understanding of what millennials want. Hey, this is what millennials want. Oh, we got business from this. Let's keep it rolling, right? It wasn't, we're going to go disrupt office space. It was like, let's give a product to people that they want, and then let's learn and listen from them and grow the business. And I think one of the most interesting pieces of tech they have is uh, their, their technology that tracks people where they're going in the office. So that's good for your manager learning if you're not working, but it's also good for kind of how do we design the space, and that's listening to your customer. That's not telling them what they need or telling them how much to give you. That's kind of a, that's the two-way street that I think we're moving more and more towards. Yeah, it makes a, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I'll give you guys a little bit of a of a generalized question. You will all have a different take, but what do you see as being um, you know, in what kind of vertical, industry vertical, do you see technology making the biggest disruption, if you will, but really changing the game um, significantly? I can't say the biggest, but what I'm most excited about is driverless cars. I cannot wait until we can figure out what we're gonna do with all this ugly parking around the country. Um, and also to be able to get in my car with my kids in the back seat, watch a Netflix, drive to LA, and then be there, right? With like a bottle of wine open in the back seat. Like, <laughs> I mean, not for my kids, for me. <laughs> but anyway, so driverless cars is my answer. Cool. Yeah, and that goes to kind of like, what are you most excited to see, you know, developed, you know, in the future or mature in the market? So yeah, I just wanna I'm, speak. I'm still stewing. You're still stewing? Uh, I would say, you, you know, I guess this is more thematic than vertical, but thematically, uh, I'm really excited about big data. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity uh, in real estate to take data and look at it in ways that we just haven't done so in the past. I think uh, real estate has essentially been done the same way for the last 50 years, uh, and there hasn't been a lot of innovation. And now there's just a lot of uh, technology on the market that allows you to collect data, analyze data, uh, develop new insights, and, and uh, do a better job of monetizing your space with, uh, with that data. So that's one area that I'm, I'm really excited about. So we've had a tremendous amount of data in this industry for years and years and years and years and years. This is nothing new. But so what kind of interesting things are people doing with that data actively? I remember a few years ago, we had JLL say, yeah, we're building a data science uh, you know, department. We're not sure quite yet what we're going to do with it, but it's here. It's happening. Um, and so now we're, you know, fast forward a couple of years. What are people using these data sets for? What is interesting? Yeah, so I'll give one uh, pretty just simple example. Um, so we uh, invested last year in a company called Measurable. I know there's some folks from Measurable here in the audience. Um, and one of the things, Measurable does a variety of things, but one of the things they do that you, you sort of think about and you're like, oh, that's really smart and obvious. Why didn't I think about that beforehand? But they take everyone's utility data and they benchmark it and they spit it back to you and they say, all right, here's other buildings that look like your building uh, and here's how you compare. Uh, and as an owner, it gives you a great opportunity to shift from an analytical conversation to a strategic conversation where you can say, okay, we should be thinking about pulling these different levers to improve the performance of our portfolio to make our portfolio more sustainable. Um, and that, to your point, the utility data has been out there for a long time, right? People could have 
done it uh, you know, 10 years ago, but it would have taken a lot of Excel spreadsheets, it would have been a lot of work, it would have been very cumbersome. Yeah. Uh, some companies were doing that, uh, and it, was, it, it would take hundreds of man hours to get to the same level of insight that you can now do with measurable at the push of a button. Right. Anyone else uh, want to comment on some just interesting data sets and, and how they're being used right, and put to work speci you know, specifically? Well, I, uh, speaking for us and some of the um, other kind of companies that we talked to about, uh, other real estate companies that we're talking to about this, I actually think if we're really totally honest, we're all still getting organized. Yeah. Um, and are st still trying to figure out exactly how to even accumulate the information in a way that we can dig through it, if, if we're talking about our own information. Um, and uh, that's something that's just going to take a while because what we've tried to do ourselves over the last 12 months is kind of hire outside folks to come parachute in who really know everything about data and give them our information, but they don't necessarily understand what the information suggests because they don't have the real estate the background. context, sure. And so um, we're, we just feel like it's something that we need to be doing ourselves just going to take time. And sure, so yeah. frankly, um, I think it's going to be a while for us um, until we are really, truly making data-driven decisions based on the information that we have yeah. about our own company. Yeah. But we're close. <laughs> Jackson, do you want to um, say something about that? Sure. Okay. I do want to hear what are you most excited for, uh, either to come to market or mature in the market? Yeah, I think, um, I'll say it again, but blockchain technology on capital markets is going to, it's changing everything. Uh, we have a pretty cool transaction that hopefully we'll be able to announce in a few weeks. and. Um, it's a completely different way of thinking about your capabilities around uh, capital formation. Yeah. From geo to minimum check size to fund structure <laughs> to not paying five points to a placement agent to everything in between. And creation, creating liquidity in markets that didn't exist at all. Things you can sell and trade that you cannot. Today. Thank you. That was my day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> We're all thinking the same thing. It's good. The, the liquidity aspect brings in a totally new class and type of investor, both I don't want to say higher class and lower class, but different, smaller check sizes where people are more comfortable getting in or higher check sizes, people more comfortable exactly because of that liquidity. Foreign investors that are not beholden to a minimum turnover and a fund restriction. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to harp on that, but that's something I'm super excited about. No, I mean, democratizing the way that you know uh, funding comes together for, for these a lot of these investments is tremendous for the industry, but also speaks to kind of that consumerization aspect and having people connect maybe even with the buildings that they live and work in and shop in and learn in and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, 100%. And then kind of going thema thematic or fundamental level, kind of like Jake is, just mobile and SaaS. As, a, as an industry, we've, like, let's not overthink this. We've just not caught up to other industries. We've not done the homework. We've not done the dirty work uh, to really find the entrepreneurs and find the opportunities to find the niches. We're now seeing second time entrepreneurs come through that there's this real page brain trust that I love. There's Yardy brain trust that I love. These guys that have, guys and gals that have created companies, sold them, cycled through, and they're coming back for their second one. And they're not, uh, they're mobile and SaaS products. They're not like sitting here talking about the tech. You can talk about the application, but let's not overthink it at a fundamental level. It's just look at what other industries have done, mobile and SaaS, and uh, try and be smart about picking winners. What do you guys think are some of the challenges in adoption that still exist right now uh, in, in catching up to some of these other industries? I think that um, it's been touched on kind of indirectly so far, but. The way that our industry works is that you have individuals in charge of, very, of, of specific physical assets. And so the ability to actually adopt something at scale is very difficult because you have a lot of different decisions that need to make along the way. And um, the mentality of utilizing a certain technology across your portfolio as something that's really actually helpful to the person making the decision in that one building is a little bit of a leap. And so it makes it difficult. Yeah, I, I would add to that. Uh, I think Jackson alluded to this, but real estate historically has been an industry that has drastically underinvested in technology relative to other industries. So when, when you think about what some of the implications of that are, one of the implications is you've got a workforce that has been in real estate a lot of times, you know, people have been in real estate 20, 30 years. If you're not accustomed to using new technology, to adopting a new technology, to having a new software solution, you know, every six months rolled out in your organization, it can actually be really painful. It can be really hard to get people who say, look, in the last 20 years, we've started using two new software companies. Why are you now telling me that we're going to use three new software companies in the next six months? I don't like that. I like doing things the way I did it before. So I, I think there is a sort of cultural shift that needs to happen in the real estate industry to catch up with some of the technolo technological changes that are coming. Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore. And, and just to add a little bit to that, 
two things required. I think C-level buy-in with uncertainty. If your executives are going to hammer you if it doesn't work, then it's not going to work. Like, C-levels need to be excited. And for me, maybe not the number one most important, but a prerequisite for doing this stuff is your recruiter. You have to look at tech background. You have to look at Silicon Valley innovation background when you're hiring an asset manager or a property manager. Um, you know, some of our best sort of admin or front desk type people came out of a square or came out of a sales force, right? And they might not be super senior, but it's just a different mentality or culture way of thinking that it's so useful internally to have someone that uh, kind of shares that, shares that mantra, shares that kind of ideology and that, that um, thirst for innovation or the comfortability with the unknown. Yeah, I want to try that. That's new. That's right. cool. Versus like kind of some of our 20, 30 year veterans like, no, they just say no. <laughs> I walk in their office and they're just like, get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. You're going to make my day harder. Uh, and some people are like, what's new? This is great. And yeah. then the, those people are the ones that kind of spur the innovation. It's good to have both probably, but it's definitely good to have that mindset. And just to jump on the bandwagon, everything you guys just said, and then also, wow, you know, to implement this, it's going to be a huge upfront cost, and we don't even know if our, you know, if our team, our workforce is going to use it or want it. And so, to the extent that we can beta test something, that is really attractive to us because we don't know if it's going to be valuable to us or not. And I think getting comfortable in this kind of world of perpetual change, there's always something new, there's no always a new iPhone, there's a new piece of technology, you know, in six months from now is something that's really uncomfortable. Um, and trying to find a comfort zone in this kind of perpetual, uh, you know, revolving door of technology is a challenge. I think for any industry, for any human being in general, but that very much is kind of the world that we live in and you don't build to be done anymore. You build to be flexible and adapt with the needs both of your tenants as and as organizations um, for the future and kind of uh, into the into no, the. I, I, I tend to agree. I definitely think that the, the the sensation that people have of getting flooded with technology is making them freeze a bit. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anything else you guys want to add before we before we wrap up? I would add, uh, you know, one of the things that has really excited me in this space over the last few years is uh, the the beginning of having people like Charlie and like Jackson in their in their organizations that are actually focused on this, and seeing a lot of the big real estate companies not only you know hiring internally the capabilities, but also, and I, th I think this is important as well, starting to set aside budgets to focus on this. Yeah. So that when you do have a new partnership opportunity or when there's a new technology to roll out, uh, you know, it's not pulling teeth every time that you have to go to the well and say, hey, we should do, uh, you know, start using this new software. We should start uh, taking a look at this new solution. So that, that has me personally very excited and uh, I'm glad to see the trend uh, continuing. One yeah. thing that I will say just quickly is we, um, uh, it has made it a lot easier for us to try new technologies to just get a sliver of, of an R&D budget to just, just for in one building here, one building there, to not have to deal with making the decision of changing our operating expenses. And it really has opened up our ability to pilot and try new things. So you're absolutely right. That has been a huge help for, um, so something worth keeping in mind for real estate companies out there. OK. Um, I have so many more questions just even listening to you guys, but we are out of time. So I hope you guys enjoyed that panel as much as I did. Um, thank you, guys.